This city, like many other cities, is characterized by having, with some exaggeration, only two housing forms. Detached buildings that look like single-family homes and often are single-family homes, and tower high-rises is what's in the imagination of uh, most people as your choices in this city. What we want to point out is that there are other choices. Choices in between the single-family home and the high-rise. Okay, I'm uh, Patrick Condon and I'm a professor at the University of British Columbia and the chair of the Urban Design Program there. And I'm uh, Scott Hine, uh, a sessional professor in the Master of Urban Design Program at UBC uh, School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture as well as the campus urban designer. You know, Vancouver, Vancouverism is well recognized mostly for bigger projects, uh, the kinds of projects that make the magazines and through marketing uh, are well understood and for many characterize our city. Uh, however, we're also a city of neighborhoods, a uh, city of neighborhoods outside of the metro core, which one could argue is just, if not more important, uh, in terms of how we move forward. And so these neighborhoods are sitting there, ready to be um, uh, thoughtfully, uh, carefully uh, enjoyed with new capacities in a way that does not disrupt the kind of scale and fabric. So new ways of building, new ways of organizing uh, buildings on singular sites, and new ways uh, through that forming uh, a community. So today we're going to look at uh, several examples of what we might call the missing middle uh, throughout Vancouver um, that are already established and, and uh, maybe not all that recognized, but uh, um, I think worth uh, taking note of. So uh, here we are at uh, what's known as Coos Corner at Hawks and Kiefer in Strathcona. And um, even on a, a sort of a dark, uh, rainy morning, it's still uh, a, a vibrant offering to, to this stra important Strathcona neighborhood that fits contextually in a neighborhood that enjoys um, interesting corners. So if you go around in this neighborhood and, and look at the, the corners, typically they're, they're um, a little bit denser, but very complex in their form and in their uses. And this project, which was the site of a former automotive garage, post-1940s automotive garage, um, is trying to do just that. Um, it was a project that struggled at City Hall uh, in its early days, uh, but ultimately it did receive approval and obviously built, and it stands as an excellent example of contextual fit. Um, it offers uh, a certain scale, uh, rhythm, and frontage to the street, given the smaller lots in Strathcona, the finer grain kind of fabric in Strathcona. These sorts of developments build their own community. So great parties here at Coos, um, a real tight community. They all support each other. Um, and it's really, really worked, I think, as a great example to hold up uh, as we think about the missing middle and uh, moving into neighborhoods with projects that have the right scale, fit, and, um, and expression. This house here that has been preserved uh, used to occupy the entire site, a 100 foot by 100 foot parcel for just one dwelling unit. Uh, it provides a really good example of how you can do both add density and use that additional density as a way to give new life to a heritage house. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to use the same exact architectural style. If you look carefully you'll see that the original heritage house and its twin, which is a newer structure, are in a heritage style, but the apartments in the rear of the dwelling sit quite comfortably in the rear of the dwelling, not necessarily mimicking that style. In terms of affordability then, it's uh, certainly more affordable than the previous single family house would have been. And it's very important to bring the distribution of land costs on a new project like this such that, okay, the site might have cost $2 million or $4 million to buy originally, but if you divide up that $4 million land cost into 25 dwelling units, then it's less than a half a million. Uh, in land costs per uh, dwelling unit, and it can be as low as 300000 This idea could play out in the single-family neighborhoods in the same way uh, with buildings certainly of a reduced scale than what you see here, but uh, you know, owners across common property lines combining their land assets and co-developing uh, multiple buildings. And I think we have um, a very talented creative design profession that could rise to the challenge of inventing new typologies at the single family scale, uh, but based on this idea behind us, a baller place. 
Uh, this is an interesting project site at West Broadway and Larch, and uh, it dates back from shortly after World War II. It has some characteristics that are really worth thinking about replicating. It has townhouse units. Each unit has a separate entrance into the courtyard. And as you can see, the remnants of uh, children's play is very obvious. So the courtyard there is protected. Uh, it has characteristics that are called sometimes defensible space, where if you let your kid play out there, you're not wondering where they are. They can be observed at all times. It also encourages kids to go out there and it's a safe space, but it's a shared space, shared by many families. So if it weren't raining today, you'd probably see a whole bunch of kids out there playing with each other. So it's a very neighborly space. And once the kids start playing with each other, then the parents inevitably get to know each other too. That's just the way it works. So it's a medium density project. Uh, it's a higher density project than single family homes for sure. Uh, and it could be even higher density than it is. It's a little low density to make the numbers work, but uh, it could be a stacked townhouse form where you could get additional density in here and not change the fundamental dynamics of how it operates. Here's a project that's at uh, 10th and Vine in Vancouver, and it sits on the site of what used to be a little church. What is unusual about the project is that it looks like all the other houses on the street. It looks like it fits in with uh, single family homes or duplexes on this uh, very fine street, until you really look at it and you realize that the density of this project is about four, five, six times greater than anything that surrounds it. So it's a good example if you're looking for ways to get additional housing into a neighborhood in a way that is context sensitive and likely not to engender the wrath of the people who live there for its departure from the norm in the neighborhood. It's a very good example. Uh, oftentimes you have situations where people in a neighborhood will object to a new project uh, and they will complain about additional density but it turns out that in my experience, mostly what they're complaining about is the incompatibility of the new form of density in comparison to how they perceive their own street to want to be. Again, developing at this smaller increment of 50 or 100 feet within established contexts and streetscapes uh, tends not to block bust. In other words, it doesn't, it shows a way to not assemble land and compel larger projects, which in its own way strengthens the fabric of these communities, the physical built form fabric of these communities. Uh, but as well, within this community, um, you know, uh, a high uh, density and number of units uh, allows for the creation of a local micro community and supportive community. And in this case, the initial idea when the church decided to develop was to create a amenity, um, a place really for single parents to reside together and then share uh, through social equity um, in community services that are needed to support uh, family life given, given uh, certain situations and it's proved I think to be very successful in its own way uh, as, as building a community on site. There's five in here, ten in there, uh -huh. and underground parking. And Do you, you like it? Yeah? Yeah, I, I like my own door. You like your own, isn't that nice? Have our own there door. it is. That's yeah, it. Sorry. Yeah. We want complexity in our neighborhoods. We want our neighborhoods to be interesting. Uh, we want to allow for different kinds of uses, making of things, producing things, uh, small offices. Can we reimagine sites or combinations of sites that allow for uh, new buildings um, that can do different things over time? Could a building be a small uh, caretaker's unit or a nursing unit or a, uh, a nanny quarters or could it become a workshop or could it allow for some shared um, uh, office uses between um, a few families. Um, those kinds of patterns of uh, site development we've not seen much because our zoning has primarily been single use, residential use in the established neighborhoods. So I think there's also an opportunity to, to uh, do some degree of small mixing and open up uh, new ways of sharing things towards that kind of complexity that will keep our neighborhoods interesting and vibrant. If residents are hesitant about uh, bringing in new density, you know, they have to recognize that if we don't do that, their sons and daughters are not going to be able to live in this city. So that's, that's, the, that's the payoff. At the same time, uh, I and many others are sensitive to the fear and anxieties of uh, residents who've been living in a neighborhood for a long time who don't want a tower to go in next to their building, and that's basically what they fear right now. 
Uh, so the point here is to demonstrate that there are architectural types that can fit in. And if I was to put it into one bumper sticker statement, uh, I would basically say it takes good architecture.